So today's uh, devotion, um, the word of the day is hands. So think about the word hands. In fact, that's my first sentence. Think about your hands. Um, lift your hands toward the sanctuary and praise the Lord. Think about your hands, what they look like, what they do, but also think about what they represent. Our hands can reveal who you are in our actions. Do they hurt others, grasp and hold on to things, show weakness, indifference, or rebel against God? Do they give to others, help when needed, love others, show hospitality, comfort, security, and strength? Many people believe their life is in their own hands, but is it? Now, look at the hands where you placed your life. Are they cold to the touch because they are so far from God? Are they dried up with guilt, shame, prejudice, bigotry, or all-consuming lust? Are they discolored and necrotic from years of evil? Are they putrid? and rotten with sin? Do they feel warm with God's love? Are they tender with mercy, grace, generosity, and compassion for all? Are the veins surging with the blood of Jesus that saves? As I raise my hands in praise to the God of the universe, I look up and see hands reaching down to me. The same hands I saw at age 18 as I lay unconscious in a hospital bed hemorrhaging. My body ghostly white, dripping blood from crisp white sheets to pool on the floor. My, I heard the words bleeding out, no blood pressure, pulse faint. I turned back to those hands of love, warmth and compassion and the light so beautiful that I wanted to follow. I looked up to the white-robed figure, unable to see the downturned face and know that I must not follow. It's not my time. I awoke hours later with a friend holding my warm pink hand. I will never forget those hands of love, compassion, healing and forgiveness and will always raise mine in praise to the one who saved me. Thank you, Jenna. You had some very good imagery in that. Yeah, it is some very good imagery. Let me clip this on. Okay. There are two June conferences coming up. No, I don't have a place to clip this. Uh, one is, is the Southern Christian Writers Conference in Tuscaloosa, Alabama that is for June 7th and 8th. The pre-registration deadline is May 31st. I have a few registration forms which I left in my briefcase, but I'll get them out. Both day, one day is 60 and both days are 115. Closer to home, the 10th Annual Barry's Books and Bridges Writers Conference will be in the Ponchatoula Community Center. That's about an hour's drive from here. They have set their conference date for June 29th. They're not Christian, but there are Christians involved in organizing this event. I have been to it a couple of times. They, uh, their theme this year is Write, Edit, Publish, and the workshops include Tough Love Editing, researching true facts for fiction, working for New York publishers, agents, contracts, and royalties, writing query letters, and what editors want to see in your manuscript. Their registration fee is $40 until June 7th and $45 after June 7th at the door. And I also have a few registration forms for them. Now, if you are a member and you have paid your dues and would like to attend either of these conferences, but you're thinking money's kind of tight, ask me for a grant. That is the only reason we collect dues, so I can reinvest and help you attend things like this and help you accomplish your writing goals. If you would like to sell books at the Ponchatoula Conference, let me know before May 30th, 
because I'm going out of town May 31st and I won't be back till June 8th. If you let me know before that time, I will rent a table at the Ponchatoula Conference so you can sell your books and you don't have that extra expense because I believe the table's like $55. And are you gonna sell $55 of books? Maybe, maybe not. They don't have a huge attendance. They've been doing this a long time, but it's not a, a real large group that attends this one. Now, the uh, registration fee at the Tuscaloosa Conference includes table space. All you have to do is check the little box on the bottom that you would like to sell books, and they'll give you a table. Upcoming next uh, meeting, June, is a critique session. So plan on bringing one or two pages of prose or three pages of poetry, Ingrid. Yes, yeah, she takes three pages of poetry. We meet in separate groups. And we will read it and we will discuss it. Or if you don't want to bring something, you're welcome to just come and sit and listen. You don't have to bring something. I finally got a confirmation from Pamela Ewing. She will be with us for the June, July meeting. She is the author of Faith on Trial, which was endorsed by then Secretary of State James Baker. Faith on Trial was chosen as a text for a course on law and religion at Yale Law School. She was featured in the film Jesus, Fact or Fiction, produced by Campus Crusade for Christ. She is the author of six fiction novels and the winner of numerous awards. Her latest book that she's currently working on about Coco Chanel is scheduled to release in 2020. One of the reasons I wanted her to come is she knows how to write a true story as fiction that communicates a gospel message. The Coco Chanel will be along those lines that she's currently working on. And she also has the moon and the mango tree, which won an award. And that was about her grandfather, who was a medical missionary. A, a, a number of people have talked to me or told me they want to write their testimonies. And that's good, but it's very tricky because you want to be careful when you write your testimony that you don't write somebody's story that they don't want it to be told. You have to respect their privacy. So an option to keep you from making family really angry or possibly getting sued is to write your story as fiction because what's important in your story is its message, not necessarily the people. So it's something to think about if you want to write your testimony, and I've had a few people tell me that they do. She'll be with us in July. Uh, attending these meetings are free, and everyone is welcome to participate, but there are benefits to becoming a member. I just named some of those benefits about the conferences. If you want to know what those benefits are, they are on a flyer on the table, and there is a complete list at our website at scwguild.com. You can become a member at any meeting, just ask me for an application. Great. Now, our speaker today is Dr. John Jeffries. He is the pastor of First Baptist Church, Chalmette. He is the author of Where, When I Can't Find God and The Last Martyr, and he has a couple of others here, which I didn't know about. We have Broken Beyond Belief, and that's the only other one is that one this is when i can't when i can't find god and then the last martyr and all of these are for sale after the event if you would like to avail yourself of one he is also the ceo of published by parables a ministry that publishes christian books for christian authors for free and I do have the information I was telling you about, about the two conferences will be on the table. If you would like to go, you can fill one out today and I'll write a check payable to the conference and give it to you today if you want to do that. Dr. Jeffries. You can go ahead and adjust that to what's comfortable. No, that's, that's, that's great where it is right it's there. It's great right there, okay, yeah. good. Well, I'm glad to be here, and uh, it's not that often that I'm addressed as Dr. Jeffries. Um, you know how you spell Ph.D. or how you say Ph.D.? Pfft. That's about the strength of it. I want you to, if you would, allow me to plant a Christian or a question in the back of your mind. 
and uh, just let it percolate there. It's a little statement, question, however you want to define it, describe it. If your life is a story, what's your story about? Let me say that again. If your life is a story, what's your story about? We write stories, we publish stories, we tell stories, we even sing stories in the ballads, the songs that we sing. So if life is a story, what's your story? I heard about a Christian, rather, let me change that. I heard about a woman, writer, who died. And following her death, she was given an option. You want to go to heaven or do you want to go to hell? Now, this is not theologically sound, okay. She said, well, since I have options, I'd like to exercise my options and let me check both of these places out. So she was taken to hell. It was a fiery place, it was hot, and there were writers chained to their desk, row after row after row, sweat pouring off of their head, and they were constantly writing, 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 writing. She said, oh me, show me heaven. So she was taken to heaven. When they opened the door to heaven, it was just as hot as hell. And there were row after row after row of writers chained to their desk. Typing and typing and typing and typing. She said, oh me, there must be a mistake. There's no difference between heaven and hell. And a voice from above said, in heaven, you get published. <laughs> well, it seems like that is the reward that many of us are searching for, the opportunity to be published. We publish and we write stories. Back in the Gospel of Mark, it states, that Jesus taught them many things by parables. I remember as a newborn Christian being taught in Sunday school that parables are earthly stories with heavenly meanings. When I completed my doctoral work, it was still the same. Parables are earthly stories with heavenly meanings. When I look at the manuscripts that come into our office, they're Earthly stories with heavenly meanings. We're all caught in the matrix of writing earthly stories with heavenly meanings. If your life is a story, what's your story about? I heard about a little boy in Sunday school, put one of his friends aside, and he said, my dad has a list of men in the church that he can whoop, and your dad's name is on my dad's list. My dad can whoop your dad. Well, a few days later, there was a knock on the door. When the man opened the door, there was this big bruiser of a fella standing there. Muscular, tall, a giant of a man. He says, your boy told my boy that you have a list of men in the church that you can whoop. And my name is on it. What do you say now? He said, well, uh, uh, sorry to offend you. He says, we can straighten that out right quick. I'll just take your name off the list. <laughs> well, think about that, if you would. If your life is a story, what's your story all about? Or you want some, does it feel like you're on some big bully list? Does it feel like, does it seem like you're on some bum deal list? Does it feel like, does it seem like you've been knocked down and you can't get up? If your life is a story, what is your story all about? Now, we know that there are many metaphors for life, and life as a story is one of those metaphors. One of my favorite metaphors is if life is like a coin. You can spend it any way you want, but you can only spend it once. And in like manner, if life is a story, and in many ways it is, you can only tell that story once. What's your story about? The Apostle Paul looked back at the Old Testament times. They were saved from Pharaoh. They wandered in the wilderness. And then Paul says their steps, their movements, the things that they said, the things that they did, 
Well, for our examples, their whole lives and their journey in the wilderness was a parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Paul wrote in the New Testament epistles, Corinthians, he said, you are our epistles, you are little stories read by people. You're not the only one who reads your story, so too do others. And if life is a story, then what's your story all about? Now, we as authors give great attention to the stories we write. What about the story that you're writing without pen and paper that is being read by people everywhere? I know we take great diligence and care with the manuscripts that we have. We want editors to affirm the correctness of what we have written and to straighten out the mistakes that we have perhaps written into our manuscript. In real life, we call that mentors, people that guide us as we write our life story. So the question again, if life is a story, what's your story all about? We uh, can look at life as, well, I remember that was a dark chapter in my life. I remember uh, with great pride this chapter, and I want to tell you about it. Don't go there. Don't go there. If life is a story, what's your story all about? Now, whether you realize it or not, the story that you write with pen and ink or the story that is inscribed on your heart, your life, your life story that's read by men and women everywhere, that story has power. I'm convinced that Jesus told the stories that he stole or, or told in, in, in the form of parables because he knew that, that there was power. There's power in the stories that we tell. There's power in the stories that we read. There's power in the stories that we heard. Some say that the Civil War was launched by a story. You're familiar with the title, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Stories have power. And Mark says in his gospel that Jesus taught them many things by parables. When they wandered in the wilderness, parables, parab parabolic action. Not too far from here. And I lose my bearings when I cross the river. When I tell this story in Chalmette, I say across the river, but right across the river from where we are in Chalmette, right up or down the road from where we are right now, there's a place called English Turn. You all are shaking your heads, so you know where English Turn is. And if you look at the history book, English Turn is a place where the English had an armada, a large, large armada coming down the Mississippi River to fight the Battle of New Orleans. They wanted to capture the city. Meanwhile, down here in the city was a Frenchman with one ship. At English Turn, that marker is not there because there's a turn in the river. Oh, there is a turn in the river, but that's where the Frenchman met with the British Armada. And a Frenchman, a wily old Frenchman, some of you are wily old Frenchmen, he pulled aside the captain of the Armada and he said, listen, this is my translation, okay? He said, listen, back there in the city, we have an armada three times the size of the armada that you have. We had just double dug up dagger in you to come. And the British captain of the large armada, he listened. He listened some more. And he said, not at this time. And he turned. The English turned. That's what happened there. Earthly stories, however, do have heavenly meanings. So let's take a little bit of a heavenly meaning. And don't, don't misinterpret what I'm saying. But spiritually thinking, what do the British really represent when they were coming down? Protestantism. What does the Frenchman represent as he was coming around? Catholicism. And so Catholicism buffaloed Protestantism and it turned around. And we are here hundreds of years later, a couple of hundred I believe, and we have a largely Catholic environment. By the way, I need to add that whether it's Catholic or Baptist or Presbyterian or Assembly is of no consequence. It's whether or not you've received Christ, trusted Him as your Lord and Savior, and born again of the Spirit. But there are repercussions of the discussions or decisions that we make in the realm of the Spirit that purely appeal to us as physical decisions. The Amada turned around, and we're under French influence. We could have been under English influence. It is what it is, but earthly stories have heavenly meanings. Jesus taught them many things by parables. Earthly story, heavenly meaning. Now Jesus said something about a certain, certain father had two sons. And as that story unfolded, that parable unfolded, somebody said, yeah, I remember the old boy. I remember that young son, wild whippersnapper. He turned his life around though, he did, but it upset the brother. People knew these people that he was talking about. A certain father had two sons. Uh, there was a widow woman. She gave the mite, 
Yeah, I heard about that widow woman. I knew her. She, she passed on a few years ago, but the story circulated about her giving a mite. I read, what was her name? We don't know. It was an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. A poor man lay outside the gates of the city. He was a beggar. All he asked for was the crumbs off the table. Whatever happened to that old guy? I remember him. A city set on a hill. Yeah, I, I said, you can really see the lights of that city at night. The city, by the way, is still there. I had the joy of seeing the lights of that city shine. Jesus took the salt of the earth kind of things and he told earthly stories with heavenly meanings. The light of the world, the lilies of the valley, the wind, the water, the bread of life, born again, born of the Spirit. He told these stories because they have power. Now, I don't consider myself an expert to be talking to a group of writers and say, here's how you need to write, but I think we can deduce some simple understandings that will help us was the old axiom, K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid, keep it simple. The first is to tell your earthly story, you need to have some facts. When he talked about the city set on the hill, it was a factual statement. When he talked about a father having two sons, it was a factual statement. The facts are rooted in the reality that you and I, our environment, is the seen things that the apostle Paul says. Paul says we have the seen things, we have the unseen things. The facts are the seen things of the stories that we write, that we tell. The story of my life and your life. If your life is a story, what are the facts? What are the facts? Also, we look not at things that are seen, but to things that are unseen. Now, most of you, not all of you certainly, are old enough to remember a guy by the name of Joe Friday, black and white television detective. Somewhere at the beginning, it would always begin with him talking to a witness and he'd say, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Now, sometimes we try and embellish the facts. God doesn't need your help. Just state the facts. Now, facts are a strange thing. They're a matter of interpretation. The facts are still the facts. When you got a financial statement that's in the red, that's a fact. When the doctor gives you a medical report, by and large, that's the facts. When you receive an eviction notice, that's a fact. Our life stories are filled with facts. Some of us want to hide the facts in the closet, sweep them under the rug, but the facts are still there. You may want to hide the facts, family secrets. There's a lot of that going on. But to have an earthly story, facts, facts, facts. The second word that I have in this way, my preacher, comes in, I, I love alliteration, is uh, focus. Now focus is simply stated, how you see what you see determines what you do. If you see something as positive, you respond in a positive way. If you see something as negative, you're gonna respond in a negative way. We're all familiar with the narration, I don't like to call them a story because it sounds like it's not true, but Peter, Simon Peter walked on water, then he sank. Uh, we have two competing facts. The first fact is the guy, the dude actually walked on water. The second fact is he actually sunk. And what do you want to focus on? Most of the preaching, myself included, that I hear about that episode in the life of Simon Peter, we focus on the fact that keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't look at all that other stuff. And that's true. That's true. We focus on sinking rather than walking. I sign most of my emails, certainly not all of them, but walking on water with Jesus. It has been that way my whole life. And the further along I go, the more I see that that's the way it's been. People sometimes ask me, I've had other publishers call me and say, man, how are you doing what you're doing? I said, that's my business between me and God. But it's my ministry. Well, you, you're going to go broke. I said, no, you can't go broke when you're trusting God with the finances of the ministry that he's entrusted to your care. Well, you're going to hurt us. No, I won't. People are going to come to you and get published by you and pay you thousands of dollars. And people can come and be published by us, and we're not going to get that money. How you see what you see. John, you're taking a risk. Can't take a risk with God. Sorry. Can't do it. Doesn't happen. What's your focus? When Moses crossed the Red Sea, put it on dry ground. And it's an amazing thing if you put your focus on what transpired there. When's the last time you crossed your Red Sea on dry ground? Or were you looking at the sea? In our little office at the church, when you come in, there's a little plaque there that says, don't tell God how big your storm is. Tell your storm how big God is. What's the difference? Focus, focus, focus. Now think about Elijah and the fiery chariot. Oh my goodness, I can't comprehend that. I, I just wonder how fast was his, his heart beating? When, when he took that first step and put that first foot down on that chariot. Wow. You know, you know who Elijah was? He was the greatest of all of the miracle-working prophets. 
And if I could say it in the language of today, Michael, he's, he's, he's the dude. He's the dude. He comes out before all of Israel and says, hey, it's not going to rain until I say it does. And then he sat down and they waited. When is it going to rain? When is it going to rain? When is it going to rain? How could he make that kind of statement? He sounds so cocky. Focus, 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 focus. Don't ask me where I picked this up. It was a long time ago. It says, when you're telling a story, you begin in one of two ways. It's a white moment or a black moment. If you begin with a white moment, your story begins with everything positive, and then suddenly the world caves in and you're thrust into the black moment, and you've got to try and get back to the white time. Positive experience. Or you can reverse it and begin with a black moment where things are upside down at the very onset, and you're trying to find your way to the white moment. What's the difference? Focus, focus, focus. Of course, as Christian writers, one of the things that weaves itself in all of the stories that we tell, faith. Faith, faith says it is so when it does not appear to be so because God says it is so, period. Let me say that again. I think I can say it twice. Faith says it is so when it does not appear to be so because God said it is so. It's that way in the stories you write with pen and ink. It's that way with the stories you tell, the decisions and the choices that you make. There's a lot of preaching today about God's favor. Uh, God's favor to me is uh, more of a contemporary word that describes God's grace. And we are saved by grace through faith. Unto every man is given a measure of faith. Faith says it is so, when it doth not appear to be so, because God said it is so. Most of you are familiar with the old story about who stood up and had a big sign behind him that said, God said it, I believe it, that says it was it for me. Somebody jumped up and said, God said it, it's settled already whether you believe it or not. So you might as well embrace the axioms of faith. What has God said as you're writing your story with pen and ink and with this body of flesh that he's entrusted you with? Fear, I'm stuck on that. Fear, what would life be without fear? The only ones who really knew were Adam and Eve. When they did what they did and it's passed on to all of us, one of the first statements they made was, I was afraid, I was afraid, I was afraid. Years ago, I pastored a little mission church. Yeah, maybe 20 or 30 people at the most. There was an old man there. I don't know why, but they called all the saved old men uncles. Uncle Dan was an old man who was saved, couldn't read, couldn't write. After I finished the preaching of the word, before we made the announcements, anybody got anything they want to add? Uncle Dan would stand up, get preaching of the sermon. Everybody got used to it. He was on fire for the Lord. Uncle Dan, to give you an idea, was one of those old Louisiana farmers. Backwoodsy kind of guy, couldn't read. We gave him the New Testament on cassettes, and he would listen and listen and listen. I always got the stories messed up, but he always had the truth. Couldn't figure it out. And one Sunday, he stood up and he said, God is always telling us about faith about love and about fear. Faith, because we often doubt God. Love, because we're so unlovable. And fear, because whether we want to admit it or not, we're often afraid, afraid, afraid. Uh, one other Uncle Dan is him, and I'm about to close. He said, fellas, you know when you're working on a car and you're turning the boat, your hand is down there where it doesn't have eyes that God sees. And if you just ask him, he'll help you. Even the nuts are threaded on the boats. Easy for Jesus. The last F is freedom. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. In the stories you write, somebody's got to be set free. It'll be a miserable story. One of the stories that we write, we need to be set free. Now let me tell you what the time I have left. What time is it, by the way? How much time do I have? Okay. I'll give you a few stories. These are things that happened to me. They're not made up stories, they're true stories. I was pastoring a little church in Union, Mississippi, Hooten Hollow, what my brother in law used to call that place. I was sitting in a little office there. By the way, I was born and raised in the Irish Channel. I am a Louisianian by birth and by choice because I was glad to come back. But I'm sitting in my little office there right across the way to Paris pastorium where the preacher lives and a little church was there and I heard this sound of it was a pickup truck it was gravel all over the church parking lot and I came to the door to look out and bam boom one of those 3,000 year old Mississippi white haired men got out of his truck and he is staggering over to my office got a gun in his hand and he's cussing up a storm he said I'm gonna blow his blankety blankety brains out I'm gonna kill that blankety 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 and of course blankety blankety is just, you know temporary beep 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 it all out the long and short of it was that he was intoxicated he had a gun his son had gotten the old man drunk got him to sign the title deed to the property over to the son and then proceeded to evict the father. And now it had caught up with him, and the father couldn't convince the son to give him his property back. 
And so he was going to blow his blankety blank, blankety blank. At all. I convinced him, give me to the next day to go talk to the son. The next day he came by, cussing, just as bad as ever, angry, hostile, same gun. And I had the bad news of telling him, I, I, I can't help you with your son. I, I tried. He's not going to budge. He started again. He said, I'm going to kill his blankety blank and got in his truck and <laughs> took off down the highway. And the only thing I knew to do was pray. And it didn't take too long, but I heard a siren. It was coming from town, heading in the direction of the pig farm. Red lights and sirens blaring. I said, oh my Lord, he done killed his son. So I got in my car and headed down to the pig farm. Didn't even get halfway there. There was the old pig farmer. His truck had turned over. He was in a ditch. They were trying to take care of him. Got to the emergency room and then the ICU and they said he had a stroke. He was so angry at his son, he had a stroke. So I went to see him and I'm not exaggerating. His head was cocked to one side. His hand was up on the other, and he looked at me, and he couldn't even move his eyes. I said, Mister, I don't know you. I don't know if you can hear me. And I began to share with him about inviting Jesus into his heart. Not one ounce of response. Next day, I went back, did the same thing. Next day, I went back, did the same thing. After about five or six days, I'm bending over, saying the same thing, and all of a sudden, this withered arm jumps up, grabs me by the neck, and pulls me right up against his ear. And he said, go tell my son about Jesus. Lost people don't want to tell anyone else about Jesus. In the broken words, he said, Jesus came to me, go tell my son about Jesus. And we'll leave that right there. There's a story there, a story there. Our lives, our stories are filled with the stories of others. They're begging to be told. I got a phone call late that night, child met. Can you come? I didn't know who she was. It's my husband. He's dying. Doctor said he won't make it through tonight. Can you come? About 30 minutes later, I pulled up to the house. I was brought into the front room. There was a hospital bed there and tubes and gadgets and machines and all kind of medical paraphernalia signed in. And she said, I don't know what to do. I just said, well, I'll call Brother John. She said, the doctor said he's going to die tonight. He said, I don't, I don't think he knows Jesus. She said, to make it worse, I don't know if he can see us or hear us, but he's paralyzed can't even squeeze your hand. He said, what do we do? Well, I did the same thing with that guy that I did with years ago, the man in Mississippi. Got down in his ear and talked to him about calling on Jesus. Jesus will come. Jesus will come. And shared with him how to receive Christ. And when I looked up, he was just like he was when I walked in. She said, do you think he got saved? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to try to find out. I said, sir, sir, I know you can't squeeze my hand. But while I was praying with you, I saw your lip quiver a little bit. If you received, if you asked Jesus to come in your life, could, could you just smile? I call him the man who smiled his way into heaven. I always tell that story wherever I go, whenever I have opportunity, because in the stories that are written, sometimes we say, that one's impossible. It'll never happen here. No, there's no way. Fully. God is a God of the impossible. I was pastor of my first little church. My wife and I were in college, three kids in junior high and high school. It was a tough time financially. I wanted to go to seminary, but I said, well, I don't have the funds to go, so I'm going to take a year off and find work. Ooh, I didn't know the economy was so bad. I couldn't find work. Everywhere I went, I could not find work. They were building a, a giant chain company in Union, Mississippi, and they were taking applications. So I went down to the little office where they said, you do apply. I told the gal behind the desk, I said, I want to apply for one of those jobs. She said, Brother John, she says, you may mean well, and I may love you and care for you, but you're not going to get one of those jobs. She said, look over there. And there were a pile of applications. She said, there's over 2,000 applications, and I'm going to put yours on the bottom. You're not going to get that job. So I left. Okay. I went down to the chicken plant. Any y'all from Mississippi you know about chicken plants? It's the worst place in the world to work. I told the guy who I was, and I needed a job. And he says, well, you don't want to work here. I said, look, my kids want to eat. I need to work here. He said, you don't want to work here. He said, it's sloppy, it's sweaty, it's dirty. There's fist fights, knife fights. He says, this is a very hostile environment. You don't want to work. I said, I need a job. He said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you don't have a job by Tuesday, you come by and see me, and then I'll put you on. He said, but you better pray. You better really pray. Well, I prayed, and Monday night I got a phone call. It was the lady who took all the applications. She said, don't get excited. She said, I do not have a job to offer you in the plant. There's a man who is painting the inside of the plant, and he needs help. Do you know how to paint? I said, no, but I'll learn. So the next day I went, and he said, you see that guy spraying that thing? Big old high metal building ceiling. He said, you just pushed the cart when he says, whoa. So I kept pushing the cart and pushing the cart. That guy quit. 
Eleanor said, hey, you've been watching them. Think you can do it? I said, I don't know. I'll try. He said, well, don't worry about it. Do the best you can. From down here, they can't see if you make a holiday or not. So <laughs> I'm spraying and spraying and spraying. And week after week, I got a guy down there, like, and he pushes me, and I spray. Wow, and he pushes me, and I spray. And one day, a guy comes up to me about three weeks later, four weeks later, and he said, they tell me you're a preacher. I said, yes, sir. He said, I've been watching you uh, paint the ceiling. He says, I'm over this plant. And he says, I need somebody dependable like you. He says, I'd like to offer you a job in a plant. He says, I'm going to put you on this big heat treating machine. I mean, it was all, you know, the, the pilots, well, that big, it was as long as this here. And, and uh, you know what? I got the job. I didn't even put in an application. I got the highest paying job inside the plant area. I'm, I'm telling you, there's a story in that, a story in that. I've always had a dream and a vision. When I was at Williams Boulevard, we were in the same church, by the way. When I was at Williams Boulevard, that my home church, my dream was to come back to the Metro New Orleans area. When, when I had the last bit of our furniture packed in, in a pull trailer, Buford came out to shake my hands. I thought he was going to give me the secret. He let me follow him. I thought he was going to give me the secret. How do you grow a church and make it big like Williams Boulevard? And he put his hand in mine, and he said, John, I want to tell you something. He's going to tell me now. He's going to tell me now. He's going to tell me now. And he said, son, Preach the word. Be in season and out of season. Preach the word. I said, Buford, I will be back. And I meant I will be back in the metro New Orleans area. He said, I know. He said, Jenny told me I'll come in back for church the next Sunday. I said, no, 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 no. I'm coming back to the metro New Orleans area. I'm going to go to that seminary over there when it's time to go, and I'm coming back to New Orleans. Well, that was my dream, a vision. It was a driving force. It was my destiny. I knew it to the core of my being. And, uh, thought it was happening. I pastored that little church in Mississippi, then I pastored a little small church in the village of Folsom, and then the First Baptist Church of Abita Springs called me to be their pastor. I mean, you could spit and hit the city of New Orleans from Abita Springs. I said, this is it. This is my destiny. This is my dream. Well, I can say this now because First Baptist Church of Abita Springs, God removed their candlestick. They're not there anymore. It was the most horrific experience I ever encountered in my life. And what made it worse was I'd grow the church, or God would use me to grow the church, and then some of the old heads would run the new members off, and we'd have to start all over again. I said, Lord, this is, this is not going to happen. And I went into the pit of despair because my dream died. My vision died. The church wasn't doing well. I wasn't doing well. They were struggling, I was struggling. I told my wife, I said, there's, there's no way, no way I'm going to get out of this church. I'm going to be stuck here. Not going to happen. And I, I'm telling you, it was one of the worst times in my life. I, I felt like the promises of God were crashing in. The vision was destroyed. I had a little 15 to 20, 30 member congregation in a sanctuary that would hold around 100. Shreveport, a church in Shreveport, Louisiana, said we'd like to uh, come by. No, excuse me, let me say it that way. First Shall Met called, and they said we'd like to come by and hear you preach. We heard that, you know, you may be looking for a church to pastor. I said, well, come on. Meanwhile, a church from Shreveport showed up on the same Sunday, just unannounced. But I got to tell you what God did. When I walked out, I was stunned and my jaw dropped. The church was filled with people. And it was a pastor search committee from Chalmette and a pastor church committee from Shreveport. And there were a whole bunch of other people. I didn't know who these people were. I honestly, to this day, don't know who these people were. And when the invitation was given, there were four of the biggest men I'd ever seen in my life come forward. And I didn't know any of them. Man came up and he said, Preacher, I need to be saved. Everybody in the church said, What? And another man came up, I, I, I want to be saved too. And another man, I want to be saved. And another one, I want to be saved. Wow. Church was overflowing with people. There were big men saying they wanted to be saved. One of the pastor search committee said, You got a live congregation. I even saw some of them taking notes. It was the pastor search committee from Freeport. <laughs> There's a story out of that. My chairman of deacons, his wife came and saw me, and she said, John, I need to ask you a question. She said, we saw what God did. There was no way you were getting out of this church. No way you were moving on. God set it up. That church could do nothing but call you. Nothing. Then she said this, we know God loves John Jeffries. What about us? What about us? Let me close with this statement. What about you? If your life is a story, what's your story? Jesus, on the side of a hillside, looked down at Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. As a mother hen gathers her chicks, so would I have gathered you, but you were not. I stood in one of those old Mississippi farmyards. You could have the sights, the sounds, and the smells of everything you would imagine there. And suddenly, out of nowhere, boom.
a thunderstorm. Me and the old farmer ran into the barn. All of the animals were seeking shelter. And it was a mama hen. And she started and running and all of her little chickadees were running under her, under her outstretched wings, except one. Out in the rain, just shivering and shaking. You would not. Don't let that be the epitaph on your story. Thank you for allowing me to share with you. Hope that something in that will help you in the writing of your story. And if there are questions, I'll try yeah, to answer. Yeah, right there. Um, am I on, Seth? Okay. Take just a minute and tell us about Published by Parables. If somebody wanted to get published, what would be the steps? How would that work? Well, first, Published by Parables, I'll tell you how it came into existence, and I'll be as quickly as I can. Uh, I wrote my first book. I submitted it. Uh, I paid the quote-unquote fees to my own denomination's bookstore to publish my book. They went out of business good for them, and that they gave me my money back. Um, and that led to the birth of Published by Parables. Uh, rather than grow into a panic, I claimed Romans 8, 28. I told my wife, I said, I know this looks bleak and bad and dark, but out of control, all things will work together for good. Published by Parables was born. Shortly afterwards, I got a phone call from a man who spoke broken English in San Antonio, Texas. He tried to tell me as best as he could that he wrote his life story, but they couldn't get it up. I didn't understand what he was talking about. He put me in touch with a friend of his from Phoenix. The friend from Phoenix said he is a part of a large church. I was once a member in that church. He wrote his life story. He's approaching 90. He's got a big life story to tell. He's got about 40 photographs that he wants a part of it. He's gonna make a long story short. It's way too big, nobody wants to touch it. And the Lord spoke to my heart. And I said, well, would you do this for me? Tell him I'll publish his book. All I want him to do is pay the price of an IBSN, and we'll go ahead and buy the IBSN, and we'll publish his book free. We'll take care of the rest, cover, interior design, uh, global platform, everything. We'll take care of everything for him, just like we would a paying customer. Fine. We get that done right as I'm finishing up, a lady calls from somewhere in the Carolinas. She said, I heard about you, and she said, here's my story. Number one, I'm homebound, disabled. Number two, I'm off in bed bound. Number three, I'm financially bound. God said, what you did for one, do for the other. I said, I do for all. So I, I did the same thing. We published our book. Somebody from Phoenix called. God said, what you did for one, do for all. I said, wait a minute, all? <laughs> one thing to do for one, one thing to do for two, do for all. And he said, what you've done for one, do for all. We've been doing it that way ever since, ever since. That's how we operate. Now, when a person gives us $150, we get the IBSN. That's what they would pay if they went to get the IBSN. Then after we publish their books, we give them 10 copies of their book back, complimentary free. Sell them for 15 bucks a piece, your book is yours, published free. <clears throat> the same presses that the big boys press or, uh, print on, we print on. How do we do that? All I can tell you is, God said what you do for one, do for all. We're over 100 titles published now. We're in our third, going into our fourth year, and uh, I very seldom promote or advertise. Uh, God seems to have the right people contact us at the right time, and um, we've been rocking and rolling. I, I haven't been, done any promoting in about four or five months. Every now and then I might put a video up or something along that line. Uh, how, do, how do you begin the process? On our webpage we have what we call a tell us link or tell us button or tell us questionnaires so on the bottom of most pages. Uh, we encourage people to use that. No matter how you get in touch with me, I'm always going to refer you back to that. That will get you in our system. And uh, the tell us feature is a way for you to tell us about yourself and a way for you to tell us about your book. From there, I'll send you an email to give a basic background, a basic structure. Then I'll give you a call after you acknowledge that you're interested. Then I'll give you another email that explains in greater detail uh, how all of these things work together. That's basically in a nutshell how, how we do that. I do look at manuscripts. Um, I don't have the opportunity to read from front to back every manuscript. The biggest part of determining what we will publish has to do, and I've talked to you one-on-one. -on -one. I want to hear your dreams, your goals, your, 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 your schemes, your plans. Your what do you want? What do you feel God is calling you to be? The way I look at it, God called you. God gave you a message. You were compelled under conviction to write that into the form of a book. 
Now it's time to get it published. God who called you to do all of the rest will open the door for you to get it published and it'll go out into all the world. Your book is a missionary. It goes to places where you can't go, speaks to people that you'll never meet this side of heaven. God gives the increase. Some people sell more books than others. Some people think, well, I don't need to do any marketing. We'll give you a marketing scheme to help you out along the way with that. And that's, that's how it is and that's what it is. Okay, if anybody has questions, just wait for me to come with the uh, mic. Do you uh, have anyone who does illustrations, like for children's books? Do or you do have what now? Anyone who does illustrations. Yes, I do. I might, might add that too. Um, I have a gal in Kentucky who handles all of our covers. I have a gal in Slidell who handles all of our illustrations. Um, the one who handles the illustrations is a for fee. Um, we publish or we provide the basic things a person needs to get their book published. Uh, we can go beyond that. We call it supersize it, just like at McDonald's. You want a little bit more than what we offer, we can do that too. I have someone who does ebooks. I personally don't do ebooks, you know, things like that. But she does, and uh, she doesn't charge the normal rate that you would anticipate. And my, my, my searching for that, you can get up to Disney type illustrators and be twenty or thirty thousand dollars and there, there's just all kinds of different wages in, in between. We do have someone I mentioned earlier that does um, editing for us but that's for a fee. Um, God didn't call me to edit, God called me to publish and if you need it to be edited think about the guy in San Antonio and the choir of that church were people who were gifted and talented they edited his book for him. They didn't need to edit his book. Same thing with illustrations, the gal in Slidell. She did all of her own illustrations, two books that we published for her, uh, dealing with adoption. She adopts children, and she did her own illustrations. A gal out in, I think, California right now we're dealing with who um, is having her children do the illustrations. She wants it to be that kind of a book. Yeah, we can do that. We can work those things out. Um, but as far as the for fee part, I, all I do is refer. You know, here's a Christian lady who does it. She does it at a reduced rate. Uh, I can't do it. I'm not going to try to do it. It's not my forte. Thank you, though, for the question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, how do we contact you, Dr. John? Um, the Tell Us feature would be best. Well, give him a website address. Uh, the website ad address is um, www.published, P-U-B-L-A-S-H-E-D, by Parables. And Jimmy, like, I, I tell you, the best way to get that is to buy one of my books. It's on the back. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Uh, no, uh, it doesn't matter. It, dot com. Dot com. Yeah. Uh, we are uh, licensed. I thought I was starting a Christian publishing business, but God had a different idea, obviously. But we are um, registered with the state of Louisiana as um, uh, we're, we're kind of, I don't know, some kind of corporation. Forget what it is. All that non -profit? Say it again. Is it a nonprofit or no? I'm not no? a nonprofit. I didn't know I was going to be a profit. No, but we don't make a profit anyway. We don't make a profit anyway. You know the guys who who told me I'm gonna go broke and I'm taking a bigger risk. When we did our taxes last year, I don't mind you around this. We finished $800 in a red. So my wife and I took care of that $800 in a red, and we got another year to go with ministry, and we just keep on rocking and rolling. And meeting people all over the world, by the way. Uh, we do have a global distribution and we're, uh, our books are available in 200 plus nations. I meet a lot of those people, we publish for some of those people and it's amazing to just encounter people in Africa, Australia, in the European nations, Canada, and of course in the United States. Uh, uh, it's just, it's, uh, to me it's fantastic. It is wonderful. One, and, and let me say this, anybody in this room can do what I'm doing. Not everybody wants to, but anybody can. And I don't use create space, by the way, even though they're non-existent. I don't know what they're having. I don't use Yeah, they're Kindle space. Direct now. They're doing it's, something. They're Kindle I Direct know. now. Something changing, yeah. you know. Yeah. I know a lot of people use them. It's just not my preference. You know. mm -hmm. got, to, got to do what we got to do as far as printing somewhere. Um, I, what is the author's cost once they're printed? If we wanted to buy books, do we buy them from you? If yes, you to resell just like them. any other publisher, okay. you would and order what your would books be, for your publisher. What would be the author's cost, say, for a 200-page book? Idea, a rough idea, uh, and I use this in our illustration, is a 150-page book, which is mm -hmm. fairly common, somewhere in that range. A 150-page book, the author's cost would usually be around $5, $5.25. Okay. 
12 cents, somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. And of course, we'll give you 10 complimentary copies once it's published. And, yeah. and after that, you, you set your own retail price. Your mm -hmm. retail price that you set determines the level of royalties you will receive. We mm -hmm. do issue royalty. We do everything just like a regular publisher. Um, okay, any other like questions? Wait, wait, let me get your question here. So Yeah, not the, my, my ears recording. don't work as good as they did when I was older. I was just going to ask the question, in publishing books, if you have a lot of photographs and you want to okay, publish. Okay, somebody say that to me again because I can't hear you. Photographs. photographs. Do we have a lot of photographs? No. Are you allowed to have photographs yes. as yes, you publish? Yes, the first one we ever published, that guy had almost 40 photographs. And there's an extra cost for that. No, there's no extra cost. Okay, no. thank you. No, not at all. Now, they need to be in a format we can use, like a JPEG <coughs> or something along that line. And we expect you to have them in the JPEG format. Now, we're, we're providing the basics to get your book published. Yes. Uh, and yes. Uh, in the manuscript is part of the uh, basics, format. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do you do you put the photos in the manuscript, or do they need to put the photos in the manuscript? Both. Both. Yeah. Okay. Any Usually other questions? Usually, what what I ask for is um, a manuscript and a, a simple word document, but everything just the way you want it to be. And then I'll take from that and create a new manuscript. Or sometimes we'll download that if, if the author has done an excellent job. We have uh, some basic specs that we send, saying here's how we want your manuscript to be when you send it to us. And of course, some of those things are above the pay grade of some of the authors, so we have to do it for them. Right. Any other questions? Oh, Russell, you have another question? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. You say you do you do pictures. Do you do black and white or color or what? We can do colors. We can do hard covers. We and there's anything, no extra charge for that? Any other publisher can. Say it again? There's no extra charge for colored pictures? No. No. Now, when you, when you use color, uh, you ask me the price for the book, generally speaking, would be $5.12 for a 150-page book. But if you add color, then it's obviously going to be more. Yeah. Now, the cost is passed on through the author to the retail price of the book. So you're not incurring any higher fee yourself. It's not going to be absorbed by the people who buy your book. Um, I'm not too keen on hardcovers. They're, they're going out of date, you know, and, and people don't want to pay the price. Because uh, if you can get a 150-page book for $5.12 and a hardcover costs 7 or $8, then you're increasing the price of that book, and it may put you off of somebody's wallet to get that book. Um, Let me come around here to Jenna. So I'm real new at all of this, so once, if we were to go to you and our book is finally published and you give us the 10 copies, you said something about marketing, so we would have to market, or do you have an outlet that people do buy no. your books? What I will do is send you some basic information. One of them, we have a document, I think it's 77 ways to market your book. It's not original with us. It was passed on from one to the other, and we put that together, and we say, here are things you can do. Second, we have another document that deals with Facebook groups. We do make our own videos, um, and we put those videos on our site, and you can take it from our site, from our YouTube site, and put it on your YouTube site. And we have another document, uh, or your Facebook site. And um, we have another document that explains how, and this is really not, nothing real formal. I mean, it's something I tap, tap down. In other words, one document is how to put your video or a video that we produce on YouTube. Then another one, same thing, how to put it on a document, how to put it on Facebook. We're not talking about Facebook videos where you buy. No, we'll, we'll give you the videos, okay? On, how many of y'all are on Facebook? Mm -hmm. All right, and you, I'm already talking to people who know Facebook. How many of you are in Facebook groups? Okay, good, good. Any of y'all in CIA? Am I the only one at CIA? You need to go type in CIA. Uh, they have a great site. They do a lot of things strictly for authors. You won't see guys like me on there. I'm there as an author. Um, but in any case, um, if you're on Facebook, you know how you share. There's that little arrow and you hit share. Okay. So you can share on your wall, which 40 or 50 of your people will see. It's no secret anymore. They're not going to let all your friends see your ad. Or your post. Or you can go to a group and post it in a group. When you post it in a group, the number of people that see it increases dramatically. But when you go to YouTube, you put your video in YouTube, there's the same little arrow to share. When you hit that arrow, it opens up a screen and you can put it on Instagram, 
can put it on um, LinkedIn. There's about seven or eight of them. Google. I get more calls from Google searches than anywhere. And part of what what our little handwritten or manually typed uh, document will show you how to create an internet awareness. I can't promise you your books will sell. I, I don't do well marketing my books because I don't market my books. But I've done so well using this little simple strategy to market published by Powerbook. I think I was sharing before most of you came in. Um, I haven't promoted maybe six months. Now, I wanted to take a break, but I'm, I'm not able to take a break because I'm still getting people coming in and they all saying the same thing. We found you on a Google search. We found you on a Google search. And I'm on that Google search because of what's in those little documents that we have. Um, okay, I'll leave it go there. What does CIA stand for, John? What does CIA, what does it stand for? CIA, I know it stands for Christian Indy, I think Association or something like that. Uh, Samantha Fury is our cover design author. She's the administrator over that site and several other sites. She's pretty well known in, in her circle. I guess my main question for all of this is, uh, if I don't want to fool with all of that, do you have an outlet? Do you have companies that email you saying, we heard about this book, you know, that you've published. Will you sell to them to sell for Give us? Give me an idea. What kind, of, what kind of company would you want? Oh, I don't know. Christian bookstores. Oh, um, let me see how I can answer that. First, there are 31,000 books printed <clears throat> every day. Every day. This bookstore or even Barnes & Nobles cannot possibly have 31,000 books come in today and put them on their shelves okay. and then another 31,000. The industry is changing and what's happening now is it's not only print and demand but there are massive computers out there that have all of this data in it and so someone in Africa or someone in Australia or someone in Araby mm -hmm. may want to order your book. They're not going to be able to go to a bookstore like this by and large and get the book but your book will probably be in whoever their wholesaler's computer database is. So that's where your books are going to go. Now, it's your job in marketing and promoting to make those people that are out there know that your book is there, and you can do that. Now, are there companies that do that? Yeah, they're marketing companies. And what I would suggest, and I have said it many times, our cost is zero at the end of the line. Now, if you were to buy these kind of services from another publishing company, you'd probably pay anywhere between two and three or four thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. If you need a marketer, go hire one. You, you save a lot of money already. Go hire one, and uh, and then you see what happens. You know. Ma Let me tell you something, Jenna. Okay. Marketing companies are extremely expensive, five to ten thousand yeah, dollars for maybe a three-month push. If you are traditionally published you still have to do your own marketing if you're an unknown author. Now, it, if you are famous, you know, <laughs> like a president or somebody in the news, they'll, they'll pay for you to go on a book signing tour. They will market your book. But until you have proved yourself, they're not going to invest money in you like that. I know an international best-selling author. She spoke at one of the first meetings here. I um, can't even remember her name now. She wrote Mysteries. She's an international best-selling author. And I asked her, well, what does your, your publisher do for you to market your book? And she couldn't give me an answer. And she finally said to me, you need a good mailing list. And that's an international best-selling author that has already proved herself. And that particular author has ventured out into self-publishing. Because she told me, I don't have to sell as many books. I still make the same amount of money because I get more money on the sale of each book. Traditional publishing, you might make a dollar a book. So you would have to sell thousands and thousands of book for you to, yeah. to books to even uh, make anything. So what, he's, what you're saying is there is a learning curve, but it's possible. Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> Thank you. I needed that. It's like most people, most people I deal with are not really interested in move, uh, money. You know, yeah. and mm -hmm. we even say it, we're, we're ministry based, not money yeah. based. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank and, you. Mm -hmm. you know, I'll say it. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't go on radio and say it this way, mm -hmm. but if somebody says I really want to publish my book, I feel like God gave me this book. I can't afford the hundred fifty dollars. 
More than likely, we're going to publish that book. Okay, you want me to edit that out before I publish it? <laughs> no, you can leave it on there. Okay. I think people know my heart. In other words, that's who I am. There's a guy in prison right now in a Colorado State prison. We published a book for him. We're getting ready to publish his second book, publish a book for his wife. Um, they were able to do something, but not what we ask normally. But their books were done. They're out there. And um, some ministry picked up his book, and they're talking with him about several thousand copies distributed to prisons all across the country. That's all God's business. That's yeah. all God's business. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Any other questions? Okay. Well, let's give uh, Pastor Jeffries a hand. Thank you so much for coming. Hey, hey, hey. That was very Good informative.